used to get in your legs. Oh, I think so. That right there wasn't any ordinary man that just entered that car. That was Nathan Blackie, a five-time gold medalist for Team Scotland, and he's also represented Team GB as an international wheelchair athlete. As a U.S. Paralympian hopeful myself, I also suffer from the same physical ailment as Nathan with cerebral palsy. In this documentary, I not only want to get to know Nathan as an athlete, but as a person and to see his views on society with the disabled community. I then want to relate to see if I'm able to relate to Nathan with my past experiences with cerebral palsy. Now it's off to the Southampton Athletic Track to see Nathan in action. How do the mechanics work uh, with your wheelchair racer, is it called? Yes. Yeah. So Basically, so I'm sat in the seat there, uh, kind of in a kneeling position to make it flat over. Yeah. And then I'll go with that. So the gloves that we've got are uh, solid plastic. So um, these gloves here? Yeah, so okay. they go on. And then it's like rubber uh, with a bit of solid plastic. You know, it's just a punch rather than a grab, yeah. as it would be in other wheelchair sports. So it's just literally a punch, flick off, punch, yeah. that kind of thing. Um, and then you've got this bit on the front of the chair, which is set for the lane on the lanes on the track. So you hit with your left hand to go around the bend, okay, and then right hand to back in the straight. Is is it kind of hard to just push this a little bit? It's really a tiring process. Um, when you first do it, yeah, it probably is. Um, I've been doing it quite a while, quite a long time now, so I kind of got used to it. It's trying to change, we've got to a point where it's just trying to change little things now. Do these tip easy? Yeah, so it's very light, so you've got to make sure, because all the weight is at the back, you've got to make sure you stay leaning forward, so otherwise, yeah, you will tip out. Okay. Um, yeah, and in like endurance races, there is quite a bit of contact. So you'd get right in behind the person in front to kind of draft them so you don't have to um, work as hard because of the wind resistance type thing. So you get a bit of drag from the person in front. But then there's quite a lot of bumping and contact. I'm good, thanks. Yeah, that's good. So we're about to actually go uh, go to class with him and just kind of see his adventure. It's about a 26-minute walk, did you say? Yeah, probably. Okay. Yeah. This is kind of um, a struggle at all, just because it is a 26-minute. Um, break. it's actually quite. It's actually quite nice. It gives me a chance to kind of get like focused on what I want to, do, what I need to do. Um, today is obviously studying first, so. Um, yeah, normally it's headphones in, music on, kind of thing. Um, depending on whether I've got uh, lectures or practice, or whether I'm going to, you know, whether I'm just going to the library, it would that would kind of dictate what music I'd be listening to. But um, yeah. 
what, what kind of music do you like? Um, I like a mix of everything, really. Um, it depends what what I'm doing. So I like kind of rock music if I'm training, and then some other like relaxing kind of stuff. Um, if I'm just not in a rush and just walking somewhere, going somewhere. What are you studying at uh, Solomon University? So I've, I'm doing uh, MSc in uh, sports science and performance coaching. Anything that we'll encounter on this journey that might be hard for you to try to um, There are a few bits where the road isn't that good. Um, yeah, I'll point it out when we get there actually. But um, yeah, one bit we've already gone past actually is that overpass. So if I could, that stairs steps only. So if I could get up there, that would save me a hell of a lot of time. So this is why I've got to go this way. Here is where kind of one of the main problems for me starts. So normally everybody would walk up that way, but that's quite steep and also it's difficult. There's no proper flat bit on that, that bit of the road. So I what I tend to do is cross over down here. Yeah. 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 It doesn't happen too often, but I just get annoyed. It just annoys me. It's just one of those little things that I don't like. Um, at least if you want to do that, ask. No, I totally agree with you. Yeah. I'm not really sure, if I'm honest. Um, it's a, it's a, that's a difficult question because I don't think most able-bodied people know what it's like to be disabled. I think that's the issue. I think the people that make decisions about stuff don't know actually what it's like. So it's basically a neuromuscular condition, so it affects my brain, so it comes from like a lack of oxygen to my brain at some point. Never really sure what's caused it, but it literally means that I've got, um, my muscles are really tight, so I've got restricted range of motion that in my legs and some, a little bit in my arms as well. How did it begin with the Paralympic journey? How did you find out about it as well? When I was a kid, I always wanted to play football. So I started off trying to play football with my friends like at school. And then I noticed from there that like, <laughs> I wasn't really getting a go. So I was lucky enough to find a disabled football team, kind of by accident as well, with somebody I found at um, AFC Bournemouth, which is obviously my my team. And, and then, yeah, I, started playing for them and then basically 
had surgery and then couldn't really like it helped my walking but it didn't like help with what I wanted to do playing football and we got to the point where I wanted to do something competitively and I kind of fell into athletics by accident slowly I was go getting better and going to competitions and winning and and it was like okay I could actually be quite good, quite good at this how do you kind of fund your wheelchair racer and how do other people fund it yeah so I was lucky with the chair I've got now so I was lucky to be like recognized by the national governing body British Athletics and um, they work with a charity called Sports Aid which we have over here which um, gives out money to talented athletes. From, you have to be recommended by the governing body to get some funding. So I was lucky enough to get some funding through one of the charities that they work with um, for that chair. But the first chair I got was paid for by mum and dad, which, was, which I'm grateful for. Your mum and dad, you said, yeah. uh, paid for your first or one of your wheelchair racers. Yeah. How much have they made an impact in your life uh, oh, just from this moment? I wouldn't have been able to do anything of what I've done without them driving me to training, driving me to competitions, um, paying for chairs, <laughs> um, even just simple things like making sure I'm eating the right stuff and um, yeah, and just the encouragement when things are, haven't been going well. Um, so yeah, it's, they've had a massive impact on my life and. Honestly, I really wouldn't know what I'd be doing without them, so, yeah. So it almost sounds like they're, they're kind of a motivator, just because they give so much. You yeah, just want to give back and, that's, that gold medal. and that comes as part of the pressure I put on myself to perform. Because I'm not just doing it for myself, I'm doing it for all the, all the hours, all the sacrifices that my mum and dad have made over the last 10 or so years that I've done the sport, so... It kind of adds a bit of pressure, but that's pressure I put on myself. You represented Team GB in yeah. the International Wheelchair and Amateur uh, Sports Junior Games yeah. in 2014, the 20th team. You've also competed for Scotland in two Cerebral Palsy International Sports and Recreation Association Games. Yeah. And while you were there, you won five gold medals in 2015, if that's correct? Yep. And then you've also won five medals uh, in the 2018 competition. Yeah going back from the start of your life where it was a challenge you know just to play football or to be accepted but now you're this international star athlete and you're still going you're looking to go to the 2024 yeah. Paris games like how does that feel just starting from humble beginnings to make it to where you are now um I, I haven't really I don't really think about it because I'm always thinking of kind of what's happening next what's the next thing but um yeah it's pretty when you put it like that is it does make me Kind of feel proud of kind of what I've done and where, what I've what I've achieved. What is your most favourite memory with your past racing experiences, running for the national Scotland team or Great Britain? But there was one time in the I was representing Scotland the second time, and I'd just done this. I'd just done finished my 800 metres. I got to see my dad, who was on the, th and he was crying because he was so proud of how I'd raced, the, how brave I'd race a race, and um. When he started crying, that started me off, and that was a moment I won't, I'm not going to forget. So it's not just it's not just the people on the track that live it; it's the people connected with the athletes that live every moment of the race. And I actually, I think it's probably worse for them because they can't control what's going on. You said recently you've been more involved with politics. I thought I was correct. Yeah, that's one of my hobbies that I enjoy getting involved in sometimes. Um, yeah. And that's because you want more rights for um, disabled people like you and I, correct? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I do. Obviously, that's a big important thing of what I'm trying to do. But I feel like sometimes people like me and you, our voices aren't heard as much as they should be. Like, I don't think I know another disabled person that's actually properly involved in politics. I, I'm not properly involved in it because I do other things on the side. I think I think of one or two. And that needs to change because if we're going to make change with disabled people, we need disabled people having an input on what's going on.
If you can say one thing to society that people need to know about, people that are disabled or disabled athletes, just, just what, what would you say on top of your head? I would say that we're exactly the same in terms of normal disabled people. We are exactly the same as everybody else. So we should be treated exactly the same as everybody else. And for athletes, it's like, it isn't just, as I mentioned earlier, it isn't just turn up every four years just to have a bit of fun at Paralympics. It is sport. It is cutthroat. It's as cutthroat as the Olympic. We don't just turn up for a bit of fun to compete. We turn up to win. We train every day to win. And I don't think people realise that. People automatically think of that when they think of the Olympics but not necessarily the Paralympics for some reason, and I'm not entirely sure why. Would you change anything, or would you stay having cerebral palsy for the rest of your life? I, I don't think I would, um, just because of the experiences I've had. I, I would never have had um, the experiences I've had if I hadn't been disabled, so you've got to be grateful for that. <laughs>